Okay, and welcome everybody uh, to the Brown Church webinar. Uh, it is an honor to have you guys here uh, joining us uh, today uh, for this very exciting conversation that we'll be having uh, with uh, Robert Chao Romero on his new book, uh, The Brown Church, just recently released last week. Uh, we're so thankful uh, to, to Robert for, for giving us this opportunity, giving Migration Christian Conference uh, this opportunity to, to speak to him and interview him uh, and ask questions about his new book. Uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar with Migration Christian Conference, we are an organization uh, that seeks to um, explore God's heart through these stories of immigration in scripture. And as we begin to understand what God's heart is uh, for, for the immigrant community, uh, we can begin to understand how that applies to our modern day context and how scripture can really speak into our modern context. Um, so the Brown Church uh, is an essential part of that. And, and when we heard this vision, this uh, book was coming out, we wanted to be a part of it. Uh, so uh, Robert, if you'd like to say a, a quick hello. Yeah, hello everybody, um, welcome. Saludos desde Los Angeles. Um, and thank you for taking time to be here, to be able to just, you know, talk about the book. I know that it's like one of the craziest moments, like in modern history. <laughs> Oh, and I do want also along those lines, want to just you know, take a moment and, you know, that just acknowledge that the, the Brown Church stands in solidarity with the Black Church, um, and, and we have intertwined histories and, and futures. Um, but thank you. I know that it's just there's so many different priorities now, so it's really an honor to be able to, to, be, to be here. Yeah, thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Robert. Um, I'm going to go ahead and go over the structure of tonight's call, just so everybody knows uh, what to expect. Uh, the first part of this call uh, will consist of Robert sharing about his book, um, the, his, his new book, The Brown Church. He'll be telling us a little bit about uh, the book, and then uh, we'll engage in a little bit of, of Q&A. Uh, and about halfway through, our hope is to uh, turn it over to, to the audience, uh, to, to, to everyone here, uh, to have the opportunity to ask questions. Uh, so just a little bit of etiquette uh, about uh, about how to uh, how we're going to go about asking questions and organizing this. Um, if you have uh, if you can click on the participants icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen, uh, you'll see a long list of, of people who here are on the call today. Uh, if you could click on the raise hand, uh, we're going to do a little practice session. So if you could just click the raise hand button, so everybody uh, knows how to do that. Uh, that is how we are going to go about. Uh, asking questions. So if you have a question during the time of the Q&A, please raise your hand uh, and then you'll be called upon during that time. Uh, one of the other things that you can, and then you can also put them down when you finish. Uh, one of the other things that we will, uh, well, that we encourage you to do is to remain muted during the call uh, as to uh, make sure that there's no background noise that, that disturbs uh, the conversation. Uh, and if you are able to uh, to turn on your screens. We would love to see your beautiful faces uh, during, during this webinar. Um, however, it, it is also going to be recorded, so if you'd prefer to keep your, your screen off, that's absolutely fine as well. Um, just whatever you uh, feel most comfortable with. Um, so that being said, um, I'd like to give a quick thanks uh, to InterVarsity Press uh, for making this book possible, uh, for, for, for coming alongside Roberts, uh, really to, to, to help make this project a reality. So uh, with that being said, uh, let's go ahead and get started uh, with tonight's conversation. Uh, so Robert, uh, if you could tell us uh, maybe uh, for, for me, maybe a, a good opening 10-15 minutes, however uh, the spirit leads, um, just share with us about your book. Uh, what is it about? Uh, what was your heart behind it? What inspired you to write it? And, and what can people look forward to? Totally, for sure. So um, I never expected to write this book. Um, some of my background, I'm, I'm, I've been a professor for 15 years at UCLA. Um, I'm trained as a Latin American historian. And so my first book had nothing to do with this. <laughs> my first book was a history about the Chinese in Mexico, which is like my own background. Um, my dad is, in, is from Chihuahua, Mexico. My mom is from China, actually. So my first book that got me tenure, it was about, about that. Um, but while I was, you know, my, my first 10 years as a professor or so, um, my wife, Erica, and I, we have been involved at the same time with, with ministry and working with, with students in issues of justice and race and trying to, you know, kind of create ministry spaces where, you know, students can figure out 
how does Jesus connect with justice, right? So we, so at the same time, for the first half of my professor career, we were, when I was not in the classroom, we were doing ministry and I got, you know, became ordained along in the process and stuff like that. But after I got tenure, I was listening to, I was listening to, to like a Lauren Hill song in Lauren Hill. She has that, that MTV, like, like kind of live album. And she says, I'm tired of, I'm tired of leaving myself, uh, half of myself outside the door. Right. And I'm like, I'm tired of leaving my half of myself outside the door at, UC, at UCLA. Right. You know, my faith and, and all this, you know, ministry activism, it's all, it's part of who I am, but I have I had to kind of leave half of that, half of it up. And I had a colleague, um, at, a, at the Chicano Studies graduation at UCLA about eight years ago, I shared with her like, man, I want to kind of go in this direction and fuse these things. And she's like, do it. <laughs> and so after that, I just went on this path of, of trying to figure out how can I fuse, you know, my pastoral ministry background, my passion for Jesus and theology with my UCLA academic career, right? And my training as, as, a, as a Latino and Latin American historian and Brown Church was the result. Um, one other thing that I'll say in terms of how it came about is, um, you know, like in terms of like spiritual gifts, my most on fire spiritual gift is evangelism. Um, it's in part because, you know, Jesus radically got a hold of my life when I was in law school at Berkeley. And um, my life was completely transformed. And that's what led me on the path even to become a professor. That's a longer story. But um, as a professor, I found, I've met so many students who have lost their faith um, because they come to the university, they know Jesus, maybe they, they, they grew up in, in, in their local church, maybe the local Pentecostal church or their local Baptist church, as in my case, or the Roman Catholic church. And then they get, they get to, to the university and they learn about structural injustice for the first time, systemic injustice, you know, education, policing, everything, right? And they go back to their home churches and they're like, how does this, all the stuff I'm learning in class, um, how does it connect to my faith? And unfortunately, there are many times they don't get good responses back, right? They're, they're told sometimes, oh, those things don't have to do with the gospel. That's political. Or they're t said, oh, well, you can care a little bit about that, but that's not really that important. Or even worse, sometimes they're told that's like, it's like against Jesus, issues of justice and so forth. Um, and so what I found is, is that uh, many of those students, and I, I can share a story here too, um, but many students I've met in that situation, they experience what I call the, and, and not just me, but in terms of this book, I call it the spiritual borderlands or the Christian justice borderlands. So imagine like, to say here's the world of Christianity, a student cares about justice, they go into institutional spaces and they're told like, nope, you don't want to talk about that. Then they get involved with activism on the other hand and the activists say, and, and I'm an activist, you know, so I'm saying that as a community organizer myself, right? If you know me, uh, but, but for the most part in the activism world, they say, oh, Christianity is simply the colonizer's religion. It, you can't be a Christian and be down. And so all these students, they find themselves stuck in the middle, right? The borderlands. And as someone who has had his life transformed by Jesus, uh, when I see students like that stuck, it just breaks my heart, right? Um, Here's this, I wanted to share a, and then I'll, I'll you know, move on, but what more I could say, but um, I, I got an, an, a, uh, this note from a student. It was part of an exercise in my, my class. I'm teaching actually a class on the Brown Church at UCLA. Um, to be very clear, I'm teaching it in a way that is appropriate for a public university. So I wanna you know, say that clearly for the record. So I'll teach Brown, I'll speak about Brown Church differently here or differently at, at Gordon-Conwell, but I'm teaching a class in an appropriate way at UCLA. But um, the student, and I'll kind of change some of the details so that their, their um, identity is, is protected, but the student read the Brown Church poem, which maybe some folks on here have read. There's a poem called The Brown Church that kind of is a summary of the book, but this student wrote, he said, reading this poem reminded me about my experience growing up in a Protestant church. As a Latino growing up as the son of an undocumented pastor in the Midwest, my experience was much different, much different from those who surrounded me. I felt that I could not identify with my peers and I always felt out of place. My white peers accepted me in the way that I stood in right by being part of their denomination. 
but I was not accepted because of my skin color, my race, or my father's undocumented status. I wanted to believe in what my family and church taught me as truth, but I slowly drifted away from my beliefs as a result of the testimony I received from the Anglo church and their members. I would ask myself, how can I identify with such ignorant people? Then more hate and resentment grew in my heart internally. Even to this day, those same Protestants referred to us as wetbacks, beaners, and spicks. I find myself conflicted with my identity. Right? And so this very sad story by one of my students, this, this is, it's, again, this is just this quarter, like within the last you know, 10 weeks, I've received this note. Um, this, it's, it's an example of that borderlands experience, right? And the Brown Church is a book, the first audience is for those who are in the spiritual borderlands to say that you don't have to wander anymore. Right? If, if you love Jesus and you care about justice and you love your Latino, Latina community, you don't have to wander anymore. You belong. You belong in the Brown Church. You belong as part of this 500 year history, 500 year history of Latina, Latino, social justice, Christian history in Latin America and the United States. There's a lot more I could say, but that would be my first major sort of thing I want to express is that this concept of the borderland and how the book as its first priority is there to say, again, you don't have to wander anymore, you belong. Wow, that is beautiful. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, you make brief mention to the Brown Church poem, which I'm actually going to ask you to close uh, with at the end of this webinar, if that's okay. Uh, but in kind of understanding just the nature of, of the book, The Brown Church, I think one of the first things that, that would be helpful for us to do is define uh, who is the Brown Church. Uh, I think there's many ways in which this, conver this, this question can be answered, uh, from questions of identity to, to, to ideas of gender. Uh, keeping these types of things in, in, in context and in conversation, who would you uh, define as the Brown Church uh, within your book? Excellent question. And I think this is so important um, to just define it like this framework um, very clearly, right? Because I've, people are going to start defining, I'm just going to be honest, we'll start defining brown church in all these crazy ways right? and make it mean all these things that it doesn't. But I want to be very clear as to what I mean by brown church. Okay. There's, it's, it's a multi-layered, multivalent meaning, right? These different layers of meaning. On the most obvious level, the Brown Church is this the 500 year Latin American, Latina, Latino social justice Christian tradition. The social justice Christian tradition of Latinas and Latinos that is 500 years old, right? And the book tells in the big picture some of those major chapters in that history from Latin American Christians like Las Casas, Sor Juana, Juan Man Poma de Ayala, who challenged. Um, colonial Christianity, to Christians who lived in the time of Jim Crow segregation, right? To Christians who lived at the time when the U.S. took over half of Mexico, right? Rogue, this rogue priest named Padre Martinez, right? Who, who challenged the colonization of the Latino church in the Southwest. To Cesar Chavez, to Oscar Romero, to the immigration civil rights movement today. Like the book tells that broad history um, to, to Latina, Latino theology, to uh, Mission Integral in Latin America, like it, it, it kind of tells that sweeping history. So on one level, the Brown Church is that all that history together, right? So and again, it's a history that most of us have never heard about. We're like, what? Usually we're just used to kind of conforming to, honestly, just white Christianity, right, that we got from some somewhere. Um, and so the Brown Church on one level is that broad tradition that most people have no idea about. Right? If you read like a typical book on historical theology or his church history, none of this will be mentioned. Maybe one sentence about liberation theology, maybe. And liberation theology is important and part of the Brown Church, but the Brown Church, again, it's so much broader than that. Okay. That being said, the other layers of the meaning, um, brown, I should define brown. Brown is not um, like, just like liter literal brown. Like I'm literally brown. Like <laughs> that's, that's not what I mean by that, right? As Latinas, Latinos, we come in all different colors and hair types and eye color and everything, right? Some of us are like me, are even Asian. Some are some are Afro-Latino, some are Indigenous, some are Euro more European, and every mixture in between, right? Jewish, Middle Eastern, everything, right? Everything is in our blood, right? 
I did like a recent, I did the, like, like that, that whatever 23 and me thing. And I'm like, oh my gosh, like I have everything inside of me, right? Um, so, but by brown, I don't necessarily mean like literally brown, but like, first of all, one layer of the meaning of brown is that the mixture that's within us, that's part of our, our culture, right? That includes all, that's one meaning of brown. The other meaning of brown is brown as a metaphor, a metaphor for racial liminality, metaphor for racial liminality. So uh, liminality is this like $30,000 word that just means in between, being racially in between. So in the United States, for example, as Latinas and Latinos, we have always been in between white and black. We've always been in between these racially constructed categories of white and black to the present day, right? Um, to give an example, I think a historical example that I think brings out this meaning pretty clearly, in the time of Jim Crow segregation, right? If someone was legally defined as black, then, then US society could segregate them in terms of housing, in terms of parks and public facilities, in terms of schooling, et cetera, right? Property ownership. But if someone was legally defined as white, again, as a legal term, all that stuff didn't apply. So in the time of Jim Crow segregation, um, Latinos, we were, Latinos, we were segregated. And I'll speak you know, about the Southwest context, which is, which is historically, uh, you know, like the time of Jim Crow was, was mostly Mexican American. But so in the, like in California, a hundred years ago, they tried to segregate Latinos and Mexican Americans in housing, in education, in parks and all those things. But we fought them in the courts. We fought them in the courts. And, and we, but, but our argument was sort of weird. We'd say, again, we're talking about the 1940s. We'd say, um, hey judge, you can't segregate our Mexican American kids, our Latino kids, because we're white. We say that again, we argue we're legally white. You can't segregate us. And then the judges would be like, they call in like the expert witnesses from like USC and UCLA and they'd be like, what do you think professor? Like, are these folks white? And 10 times out of 10, this surprises people, 10 times out of 10, the judges would rule that we were white and therefore that we couldn't be segregated. But that didn't stop our you know, white folks from still segregating us and discriminating against us anyways, right? We'd still return to our communities, to Pasadena, LA, Santana, wherever, with the little judges order and they'd still treat us like really bad, right? And still find other ways to discriminate against us. So that's an example of how like historically we were kind of like, well, we're not fully white, but we're some of the privileges, but we're not black. And like, and to that day, like um, our institutions of church, institutions of government, institutions of everything, right, tend to be framed along black white lines. And so as, as Latinas and Latinos in the United States, we feel that in between this. So there's a line in the poem that says, you know, when, when, when black and white come to talk, we're not invited to the table. And I think that's, that's part, of, part of that racial liminality. I will say also that, that liminality is not, that Brown used in that way as a metaphor for racial liminality. It's not, a, it's not only Latino for that matter, right? Um, as I share this framework with others, like I have my friends who are South Asian and they're like, man, they'd say, yeah, this really makes sense to me, right? Or Asian Americans or um, other people. I mean, a person can be white and feel Brown or black and feel Brown too, right? It's like, it's not, so like, in that sense, brown is sort of, it's just anyone that feels in between um, in that racial sense. Um, and brown, so brown is a fluid space also. It's a fluid space historically. It's not just like one thing. So certain groups come into it and certain groups go out of it, right? And as you know, we could talk about later, Jesus was brown in that sense as well, but I won't go into that now. But so those are some of the different layered meanings of brown church. Um, and there's others, but those are some of the main ones. Thank you so much. Uh, for those who are unfamiliar with uh, Migration Christian Conference, part of our vision is to explore uh, just the stories of uh, immigration within scripture, but as well as in uh, our, our real world today and throughout history. Uh, so Robert, a question that I would have for you, and this is uh, a little bit off of the script. Uh, what would you say are probably, probably one or two stories that you found throughout your research in, in, in Latino church history that really resonate with you uh, that, that you believe have, have played a very important voice in making the Brown church who it is today? Sure. 
I mean, the one main story, there's so many great stories that are, I could tell, but one of the, one of the stories that I can keep coming back on now is the story of Mission Integral, Mission Integral, in, Integral Mission in Latin America in the, in the 70s and 80s. Um, so in the 70s and 80s, um, or even before that, but like 60s, 70s, um, you know, Latin America was just like in, in upheaval, right? It was like dictators and these horrible things and like, you know, people getting disappeared and just profound racial inequalities, way of racial but economic inequalities and all these things. Um, and you had a um, you had folks like like um, este, um, Samuel Escobar and Rene Padilla and others who were they were part of of Latin America's intervarsity. It wasn't called intervarsity in Latin America, but part of that what we would call intervarsity. And they they came they got training in the United States like at say like um, Wheaton or stuff like that, places like that. And they got in certain ways, very good training, but in certain ways, training that was very lacking. And, and I'll explain what I mean that in a second, about that in a second, but they went back with the way, with, with their, uh, the framing of the gospel as very individualistic. They went back to Latin America, right? To this revolutionary context. And they tried to do ministry, campus ministry, the way campus ministry has been done historically in the United States, right? Like, um, the, individ the individual part of the gospel, which is incredibly important, right? I never want to minimize that, but which is not the full thing, right? And um, the students would be like, what are you talking about? What, you know, what you're talking about, what does that have to do with the fact that my uncle just got killed last week or disappeared or, you know, all the social upheaval? And they're like, oh my gosh, you know, like, and, and, and so that led them, um, many in Latin America, Protestants in Latin America to have to rethink the gospel that they had been trained in to reframe it. And they came to this place where they had to deconstruct, deconstruct the gospel that they had received, the biblical frameworks that they had received, and to reconstruct it in a way that they felt was still faithful to scripture, had Jesus in the center, but which was um, kind of stripped of what they called ropa anglo-sajon. They called it la ropa anglo-sajon, like the Anglo-Saxon cultural clothing. They said, oh my gosh, you know, maybe some of it's okay probably, but like the gospel, it's just like, we're just trying to work American clothes, right? Um, Gavachito clothes, right? And it's not working. Um, and um, so they, you know, went, went through this process and they said, wait a minute, something's wrong with the gospel. If, if someone can believe in the gospel and still support dictators and have all this economic inequality still, there's something wrong about that, right? There's something wrong with the gospel that condemns revolutionary violence, but is okay when dictators do it, and so on and so forth, right? Like, so um, the framework of, of Mission Integral, like you had about, I think about 25 leaders from Latin America, different denominations, theological backgrounds and so forth, that met in Cochabamba, Bolivia, Cochabamba, Bolivia. And they said, how do we frame a theology that is, that, that is faithful to our contextual context? And Mission Integral was that. That, that framework, right? And Mission Integral basically just said the gospel is holistic. To put it real simple, the gospel is holistic. The gospel involves Christ's transformation of us as individuals, but the good news is also about um, the Holy Spirit's transformation of society. Every aspect of creation, nothing and no one is left out, right? And they use this metaphor of, 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 of the gospel as a wing with two, a plane with two wings. It's kind of hard to do that not that flexible, but imagine this is the gospel, right? One wing is, is the, the, in the personal transformation in Christ. The other wing is the social transformation. One wing is um, the verbal proclamation of the gospel. And the other wing is the, the embodiment of our faith through works of justice and mercy and, and love and compassion, right? And if you're missing any one of the wings, the plane's gonna crash. Either one. And I think that the tendency in most of our, I think most probably, um, churches in the United States today is they're missing one wing or the other. And so people are like jumping out of the plane because they've noticed that it's crashing. I think that's, that's what's happening right now in this exact moment. It's like people are bailing out of the plane because they're like, oh shit, this plane is going down, right? Like there's something profoundly wrong with this plane, right? When George Floyd can be killed like that and so many Christians still say nothing right and so on and so forth right 
Um, and, and so I love that framework of mission integral, of, of holistic mission, because it, like, it, it, it provides us a method in the United States today to deconstruct and reconstruct our faith in a way that stays tied to the local church, stays centered in Jesus and scripture. So that's, a, that's one story of many. Absolutely. Thank you so much. I have one final question for you before we jump into to the time of Q&A. Uh, that being uh, one of the, the way in which you open your book, um, you, you share some stories uh, and, and you touched a little bit upon this uh, at the beginning of the call uh, of people who have gone into these different institutions and have been told uh, that Christianity is the white man's religion from many different ways. And that has moved people into a place where their faith has been shaken. Um, how would you, how does your book respond to that, to that question? What, what, what is it that uh, people can look forward to in, in learning how to, to speak against that narrative? Sure. Well, I think, first of all, like in a very broad sense, the whole book is about non-white people <laughs> being Christians and pursuing justice in Jesus. So that's, you have 300 pages of that. So that's the, the, the answer in the most general, general way possible. But I think that also, you have to start with Jesus himself. Right? Who was Jesus historically? Who was Jesus, fully God, fully man, that walked around this place called Galilee? What was Galilee? What was the context there, right? And honestly, like, this troubles me. I, I'm almost becoming emotional, right? Even because on the right and the left, I'm going to be really honest, right? On the right and the left in Christianity, you have people redefining Jesus totally outside of who Jesus was in his historical context. And it just scares me so much, right? I mean, that's, that's what, what um, colonial Christianity did for 500 years is it tried to define Jesus outside of historical context, his historical context. But I fear, dear brothers and sisters, that on the left, people are doing the same thing too, right? So let me explain what I mean. And I'll draw from, from Latino theology. Um, in, in Latino theology, Brown theology, you know, the, the you know, and I, I talk about Brown theology as the 500 year tradition of Latino Christian social justice theology. Wrap your mind around that. We've been thinking about Latino social justice theology as Latinos and Latinos for 500 years. It did not start with the Justice Conference in 2007. I'm sorry. <laughs> We've been thinking about it for 500 years. Since before the, 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 the pilgrims ever landed, even, even where you are right now in the Northeast, right? Um, we, we've been thinking about this. How does, okay, but I'll stop there. Okay. Um, <laughs> what was I? Oh, shoot. Okay. Yeah. Galilee, right? So Latino theologians um, like Virgilio Elizondo, like Elizabeth Conde Frazier, like Samuel Escobar, like others, Orlando Costas, they read in scripture and they said, oh my gosh, why does the Bible talk so much about how <laughs> Jesus was from Galilee? Why does it say so much about Galilee, right? And um, what they argued and, and, and what they saw reading the Bible through their historical, their cultural context, they said, Galilee was the hood. Jesus lived in the hood, right? Galilee was the barrio, right? Galilee was where the, where the marginalized, those who were marginalized socioeconomically, politically, everything, religiously lived in Galilee. The power center um, of Jesus' day in his own ethnic community was in Jerusalem. Jerusalem was like New York City, Wall Street, you know, the temple, all that kind of stuff. That's where the power was. Galilee was like this marginalized place, right? Um, far away from the, the structures of power. People in Galilee were tricultural, right? They were Jewish, they were influenced by Greek culture, Roman culture, they, they were, at least bilingual, they spoke with an accent. You could tell if someone from Galilee was there. Um, Galilee was like, you know, like the famous line in scripture, like, can anything good come from, from Nazareth, right? Nazareth, where Jesus was particularly from, was like the hood of the hood. Galilee was the hood, and Nazareth was like the hood of the hood, right? Um, and what Latino theologians say is, that's not an accident. Jesus was a brown, young, adult, Middle Eastern man, who lived his life mostly in the hood, picked his followers from the hood, right? Um, and 
did most of his ministry there. So when Jesus launched his ministry to transform the world, he did it from the hood. I will say also that, Gal that Galilee could also be pick the most rural white place in Ohio where, where, we, where everybody looks down upon those people. That's Galilee too. Or the most despised place in China, the ethnic minority groups that are just shunned and rejected in, in China, that's Galilee as well, right? But um, so to say that Christianity is a white man's religion from a historical perspective is preposterous. Jesus, he probably looked kind of like me, I would imagine, right? Um, and he lived in the hood and he died on a Roman cross um, from, from imperial police brutality for charges of rebelling against the Roman Empire. Something I'll just say too before I stop is like, um, <clears throat> Jesus was very subversive, right? He's very subversive, right? And the early church was very subversive because it was Caesar, the Roman emperors that called themselves Lord, Savior, Son of God, anything like that. Um, when, when a new emperor was born, they'd say, there's good news, the new emperor is born, or there's good news, Rome just won on this battle. So when Jesus started saying, preaching the good news, which was reserved for what Caesar said, that was very subversive. When the early Christians said, Jesus, you're the Son of God, you are Lord, you're Savior of the world, those are, all, those are taking from Caesar, from empire, all those terms and applying them to Jesus. So from that historical perspective, it's preposterous and sickening that historically for 500 years, you know, as part of European colonization, people have made it into the white man's religion of oppression and power and money. It doesn't make any sense given the historical context. Thank you so much, Robert. I'm sure people are dying here to ask you questions. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and open up for questions. As we practiced at the beginning of the call, if you have a question, if you could please click on the participants button and then on the raise hand button, uh, your name will be written down. Uh, unfortunately, due to time, we probably won't be able to get to all the questions, but we'll do our best to get to as many as possible. Uh, just a quick reminder as well, because we're limited on, on time, uh, let's make sure that we're asking short questions uh, and not sermons uh, per se, but really making sure that they're, they're short, succinct. Uh, maybe keep your questions to about uh, 30 seconds. So um, I see that we don't have any hands yet. Uh, does anybody uh, have a question that they'd like to ask? Uh, right here we have uh, Dr. Espo. Uh, yes, please. Actually, I think you will be unmuted. So one moment. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm unmuted. Okay. Good to go. Dr. Romero, I want to uh, thank you first and foremost for uh, an amazing uh, book. Uh, I, I wrote in the chat. It's like uh, city. It's like waiting for my abuelita to finish cooking Thanksgiving meal. Um, <laughs> so I really appreciate it. Um, I, I wanted to ask you a question in regards to the Brown Church uh, concept uh, and and how me as a millennial, how I would be able to um, help or bring about the conversation in a transgenerational church where we see um, first gens, first gen uh, Hispanics and second gen, third gen Hispanics and how we can bridge that conversation uh booted off of this round church mm. thank you thank you so much yeah and, and thanks for all your kind words and support um and that's a that's also like i think like a second the, the you know the real big strong hope of this book is that it can help bridge generations right so i grew up in super traditional like when i was a kid latino american baptist church they only spoke spanish Anytime the English service got too popular, they kick out the English pastor, that kind of thing, right? Um, but what's so sad is that, like, when we were all displaced. You know, we grew up in El Salvador, Iglesia Bautista, until we were 18, and then we were just, like, we were, like, nowhere to be found for, like, 10 years because we didn't know where to go, right? And I think that, that that flight from the Latina church is very much on the minds of, I think, I would imagine, you know, many from of our elders, right? I think that they want to know how do you how can we sort of stop this 
this uh, spiritual drain, if you will. Um, and I think that like the stories in the book, I think, and the stories of of young young Latinos, Latinas, um, and, the, and and their experience of leaving and being in the, in the borderlands. Hopefully, that could be a good place to start, right? Even just from like one story, um, just like from a, from a pastoral perspective. Not even getting into like the any justice things or anything like that. Even not even there, but being like, okay, what's happening with this big trend, right, of people leaving? How might this book sort of speak to that? Um, and then I think another way to, to talk about it, another concept is um, the concept of community cultural wealth or, or community or cultural treasure, cultural treasure. There's a, there's a really, one of my favorite passages in the Bible in Revelation 1, Revelation 21, just 20, 27. And this is where John is, John is describing the new Jerusalem, right? After Jesus comes back, makes all things new, what is it going to be like? And John says these, these, these words that are almost never preached about. He says that the glory and honor of the nations will be brought in. The glory and the honor of the nations will be brought into the new Jerusalem. But nothing that causes sin will be brought in. I'm paraphrasing, right? If you translate that word glory, um, it can be translated treasure and wealth in the Greek. Treasure and wealth. So you could say in that passage, the cultural treasure and wealth of the different ethnic groups of the world, the cultural treasure and wealth of the different ethnic groups of the world will be brought into the New Jerusalem forever, right? Forever, right? But nothing that causes sin will. Um, just as a brief note that all of our, so all of our ethnic groups, our Latino culture, in its diversity has this distinct, beautiful cultural treasure. Um, and has distinct sin as well, like machismo or something, right? Um, American culture has great things, cultural treasure and wealth. That's why we're here, right? <laughs> but it also has horrible sin as well, right? Like the racism and greed, right? And every ethnic group has glory and honor and sin. Um, another reason why so many youth are leaving is because they want to worship God in a way that expresses their glory and honor the community cultural treasure and wealth of the Latino community, not just worship God in, in, the, in the community cultural wealth of Anglo-Americans, right? Even though that's, val that's valid too. So I think that maybe like thinking about like with the different generations, how can we, how can we, um, you know, make our worship better, make our teaching better, make our theology better while maximizing this, this cultural structure and wealth of the Latino community in its all of its diversity. Perhaps that's an entry, entry point as well. Thank you, Robert. Um, if we could um, have uh, Dr. Orlando Crespo uh, next. <clears throat> and you will be unmuted, so one moment. Okay, can you hear me now? Perfect. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Good, good. Good no, um, Robert, great to see you. Okay. I was just wondering, I love your definition of the Brown Church because I think it's, it's expansive and, and inclusive, particularly of you know, when I think of Middle Eastern folk or, uh, or Southeast Asians. And uh, so I'm excited about that, but I'm just wondering what your sense has been from Asians in terms of how they receive their understanding of being part of the brown church based on your definition do they embrace that or or do they um push against it sure so first of all there's a small but really proud crew of asian latinos out there right <laughs> and, and we find each other right and and those of us who are asian latino like we're very happy about it right like, yes let's be a brown church mm -hmm. um in, in, in terms of the, the broader asian american community you know, the question of like, is there a resonance with this meaning of brown as in between? Um, I, you know, I haven't field tested the ideas into too many circles like that. I mean, like I did it like, like a uh, covenant, denomination, covenant denominational space and stuff like that. And there is some resonance. I think that, that like where the resonance happens is probably more like they might not re resonate just with the term. Like if they just hear, oh, brown church, they'd be like, oh, I guess that's Latino. 
but I think that like when, when you start to um, express brown in the way that it practically, you know, what it means in a day-to-day -day life, I think that many more Asian Americans could identify with it. For example, the idea, and, and, I, and actually my definition of liminality, I take from Sang Hyun Lee from Princeton Theological Seminary, right? There's a book, his book is called like From a Liminal Place. So I think that there are, that concept of liminality, um, it's not, I guess people have to have, have to have to sort of like be walked through what does it mean? So for example, like if I speak to one of my Asian American friends or close friends or family members for that matter, and I say, are you allowed to express your Chinese identity when you go to that big mega church over there? How does it make you feel? If I put it that way, it probably would be like, actually, no, I can't, but I wish that I could. So I think it's like a different entry point, but I think that, that maybe the better way to say it in the Asian American context would be sort of from the standpoint of liminality. Maybe brown is just not, a re a, that as a metaphor, wouldn't resonate as much. Yeah. It's so good to see you, Dr. Reverendo. <laughs> Also, like, again, like, uh, Dr. Um, Orlando is like, what I mean by the Brown Church, in case you're looking for like, just a really, out of the theory, you know, the work that, that he has done with, with, with La Fe and, and Latino campus ministry for decades, that's the Brown Church. Yes, absolutely. Uh, next, we have uh, Diana Ortiz uh, Hiron. Are you gonna unmute yourself? Hi. Hi. Dr. Chao Romero, thank you so much for your book. I am so excited to read it. Um, my name is Diana Ortiz Hiron, and I am a product of the LAFE ministry. So very oh. grateful for uh, <laughs> Reverend Dr. Um, Orlando Crespo. I'm also a Harvard Divinity School al alumna, and um, I am interested in um, immigration within sort of the um, Protestant community, right? And, and sort of the, the challenge of uh, different interpretations of biblical scripture on immigration, especially after the Trump election. And so I'm curious to hear from you how this book, um, where you touch on, on, if anything, on sort of theology from the margins, theology from the margins, specifically looking at immigration within the Latino and Asian community, and if any of that informs sort of the, your perspective when you wrote the, the book, particularly around politics. Yeah. So. Um... So, so much of, I mean, almost all of the book is written from the margins. It's theology from the margins. Um, to give you examples of that, and like in, in, the, the, in the colonial chapter, when I'm talking, you have a couple of chapters on that, like brown theology and brown church in that time period. I highlight the, the, um, this famous book by an indigenous Christian by the name of Juan Manpoma de Ayala. Right? He lived in Peru and he, he was, just, he was indigenous, right? But he lived exactly at the time of the Spanish conquest of Peru. And he came to follow Jesus, but he also came to just like, of course, just despise all of the colonial abuses. He wrote like a book that's probably over a thousand pages long. <laughs> um, and he even drew like kind of a, accompanying illustrations where he just, in, in like a thousand pages or more, he called, he, he, called on Spaniards to repent of all their injustice while still following the true teachings of scripture. And it's this amazing book where it's like, it's also interdisciplinary. It's like, he tells the history of the indigenous peoples of Peru. He cites the Bible. He does all these things. It's like political. He calls out the colonial like government officials. It's like amazing, right? So, so the book itself is like, it's theology from the margins, right? In, um, in terms of, of immigration, um, I do reference, um, you know, authors that address that. For example, um, the amazing book by Karen Gonzalez. You know, do you know Karen Gonzalez's book, um, The God Who Sees? Have you heard of that? That is my favorite book on immigration that exists, The God Who Sees. And there's a lot of, there's some pretty good ones, especially by Latino authors. But Karen Gonzalez, who's a friend of mine, she wrote this book called The God Who Sees. And I love that book because, um, it's written from the perspective that Karen has as a migrant, a refugee from Guatemala, as an immigration law practitioner with world relief, as a fuller trained theologian, right? And she writes this book where she examines scriptures. It's amazing, right? So to give you an example of, of, 
of her unique insights that come from that intersectionality. You know, she says, for example, that the baby Moses was the first unaccompanied minor. Right? Or she says that if, if Moses lived today, he wouldn't be able he wouldn't be able to get a visa to come to the United States <laughs> or stuff like that, right? Um, so, um, in terms of, of of like immigration theology, um, I had written in an article. I didn't expand upon it in this book, but the way that I look at it, and I'll just make this brief. Actually, I'm going to back up and say um, that I'm, I'm, I want to mention Karen's work in the context of also many other amazing Latina theologians as well. Amazing Latina theologians. It's super important to highlight that, right? That the Brown Church has a, a long history of that, starting with um, Sor Juana Inés de la Cruz, right? Sor Juana Inés de la Cruz, who wrote in the 1600s, right? So Juana is, 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 is thought of as like the first, everyone tries to claim her because she's so badass, right? She wrote like, like in the 1650s about how, um, and she was a nun, wrote about, you know, um, women's right to, to, to um, write theology, right? And, and, and to reflect upon, you know, theological issues. And she was one of the first interdisciplinary theologians. You know, she, she drew from history, literature, all these, you know, theology, um, and she got in trouble for all of it, right? But from the, from the, you know, she had this amazing legacy from the 1600s, but also more recently, um, you know, uh, Mujerista theology from the Roman Catholic tradition, Ada Maria Isasi Diaz, and from the Protestant tradition, Latina Evangelicas, again, like Elizabeth Conde Fraser and others, Sandra, um, Sandra Maria Van Opstel, so many things. I, I wanna be sure to highlight sort of that there is this broad tradition um, one of, of, of the unique applications of, of Latina theology is taking the concept of the preferential option for the poor, so the preferential option for the poor and applying that to, to the experience of, of mujeres, right? So the preferential option of the poor, as many of you have probably heard, is the concept that came out of Latin America, uh, liberation theology that says, even though God loves everyone equally, there's a special concern of God's heart for the poor and immigrants and whoever is marginalized, right? That's the preferential option for the poor. Oscar Romero and others, right? Um, um, what Mujerista theology did was it said, God has a preferential option for women. God has a preferential option for women. Because in a broken, fallen world of, of machismo and sexism, guess which gender gets the raw end of the stick, right? Women, right? And, and so there's these amazing sort of, so I want to encourage, I want to be sure to highlight that, right? You know, dig into Mujerista theology, dig into Latina Evangelica. Um, my favorite, personally favorite book on the topic is a book, it's called Latina Evangelica, Latina Evangelica, you know, by Elizabeth Conde Frazier and others. Um, in terms of, my, of immigration, I'll just say one thing real quick. My principle of, of immigration from the scriptures is something that I call migration as grace. Migration as grace. That if you look through the Bible, every time someone immigrates, you'll find, first of all, migration is everywhere in the Bible. First of all, it's everywhere in the Bible. From, from the page one where God says, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, to, you know, to Moses, to Abraham, to Jesus, everywhere, it's everywhere, right? To the scattered early church. But what you find, what I find is that when you look at places where people migrate in the Bible, where they migrate in the Bible, God uses, redeems, and uses the migration process to extend God's grace to the migrants, to the migrants, but also to their host countries, if the host countries are willing to receive them with biblical hospitality. So <clears throat> an example, of course, simple example is the baby Jesus, right? Like th this narcissistic, terrible, horrible Herod is going to kill him because he's threatened by the baby Jesus. So Jesus is, you know, and, and Joseph and Mary, they're told by the angels, right, to go flee to Egypt. Migration is grace. As you migrate, God will show God's grace to the Holy Family um, by saving their lives, right? Um, migration is grace, right? Um, Joseph, slave traffic, you know, in Egypt, right, a forced migrant, but God redeeming that horrible experience to make Joseph the hero of the narrative who saves the lives of thousands and thousands of Egyptians and Canaanites and right by being able to, 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 to rise up in, you know, second into command of all of Pharaoh and being able to interpret Pharaoh's dreams. So anyways, migration is grace. I have an article about that. You, if you go to, 
to the Matthew 25 website, matthew25socal.org, which is the immigration um, org that I'm on the board of. You can find that article. Um, so a lot more that could be said, but thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. I think uh, what you just shared beautifully encapsul encapsulates the vision uh, of Migration Christian Conference when it comes to, to the Bible and immigration. Uh, let's go ahead and move from the East Coast to the, web to the West Coast uh, to Dr. Leon Harris, uh, Professor uh, of Theology at Biola University. <clears throat> hey, thank you. Um, I, I really appreciate this book, and I really appreciate, uh, Romero, that you uh, wrote this. Um, I, I may have met you at AAR. I can't really remember. Um, uh, but to keep things short, um, I arranged for a, a reading group this summer of, of multidisciplinary faculty, and we're reading your book. So my, Thank you. I'm honored. honored. Uh, you, you're welcome. We're, we're looking forward to it. So my question to you is, since it's multidisciplinary and, and it's a bunch of different ethnic groups, and so it's just not the theology department. It's, it's everybody. Um, what is maybe two or three things that you would say, make sure you get this out of the book? You know, when you get a bunch of academics, we go all crazy. <laughs> yeah. So, so sure. what is the two or three things you say? Make sure you focus here. Don't don't overlook this. It may seem minor to you, but it's crucial to your uh, understanding the the framework of my material. I think you understand what I'm asking. Yeah, for sure. No, thank you. That's a good question. It's good to see you again. Um, first, the the key thing from this book is identity. Identity and how like, I think it's millions, millions of Lat young Latinos and Latinos are looking for a spiritual identity that is faithful to Jesus and their experience with justice, right? That's so key. Um, someone who just started reading the book, she, she said these really nice words on, on social media. And then she said, hashtag, he's talking about me. It was hashtag, he's talking about me, right? So, so many people are like, where do I fit? I'm in this borderland experience. I don't fit in church. I don't fit in activism. And, and the Brown church is like a, it's a framework really that where those who are in the borderlands can say, Oh, I finally belong. Thank you, Lord. Right. That's the first thing. The second thing I think is um, the concept of, and this is where I draw from critical race theory in the book to frame it. Of, I mentioned it earlier, um, community cultural wealth community cultural well. <clears throat> and I draw, in the book I draw from my colleague, um, Tara Yoso, who came up with that term, Tara Yoso and Lindsay Perez Huber, they talk about community cultural well. Originally it's in the context of education and, and you know, in traditional education studies, you know, basically the idea was make minority kids little middle-class white kids and then they'll succeed. <laughs> That's basically like, Stated directly and indirectly, that was like the model. And Tari Yoso and this framework of community cultural wealth said, uh-uh, that's not right, right? Communities of color, we bring our distinct community cultural wealth to education, to the institutions, and we need to capitalize upon, not capitalize, that's bad language, but like we need to start there, right? And so she framed like there's different types of community cultural wealth in minority communities linguistic capital, aspirational capital, familial capital, et cetera. And Lindsay Paris Huber said there's this thing called spiritual capital, spiritual capital, right? And, and so my book is saying, hey, there's, there's this distinct Latino community cultural wealth for 500 years. There's this distinct spiritual capital for 500 years, right? And, and basically the church in the, Ameri in the United States just ignores all of it. <laughs> basically, whether it's our seminaries, our colleges, our churches, our denominations, there's basically none of that glory and honor stuff from Revelation 21 gets it gets into the door. So I think that, that I think those would be like the two big things: identity and community cultural wealth. Thank you, Robert. We have time for one more question, uh, and we'll go ahead and return back here to the East Coast uh, to Patricia uh, Sobalvaro. Uh, who actually leads an immigration consulting agency here in the Boston area called Agencia Alpha. Uh, they do amazing work uh, here in the city. So uh, nice. yeah, we'll go ahead and let you have the last question for tonight. Thank you, uh, Danny. I'm honored. Um, Robert, I guess I want to go back to one of the first things you said earlier, how many of us um, sometimes go through Christianity feeling guilty as we do more activism work. 
And, you know, we have this great respect for our leaders in the church and then they preach sermons and then we feel guilty because we're feeling we're going away from a Christ-centered ministry. How do we go through that healing, that process of healing to understand that, no, we're not being um, anti-Jesus because we want to, you know, fight for immigration reform. So how do you go through that healing process at a personal level? Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you for all, all your amazing work there in the city. Um, I, oh, it's tough. It's a process. It's definitely a painful process of, like, part of it is kind of understanding, you know, reading in scripture that, hey, you know, this is God's heart. <laughs> so, you know, just becoming, I think that gives us, like, the sense of, like, we're actually, we're on the right page, actually, right? Um I think immersing ourselves in scripture related to <laughs> justice and race and immigration, um, understanding this long history of the Brown church. When you read it, you're like, Oh my gosh, I'm not alone. <laughs> wow. Like, um, I think it's so hard, right? Like, um, I think it's a process. I think that's another thing to keep in mind. Like, so at first it's like a process where like, and I learned this from Dr. Conde Frazier. You have to get mad first. Honestly, you have to get mad. Like it, it's like a, champagne bottle the cork has to pop off <laughs> and you have to like give yourself as we have, we have to give ourselves as much time and space as we need to to just get the anger up the anger has to go somewhere right if it's just stuck in oh my gosh you know um and you, can, you know and, and to find you know jesus in the midst of that and and a couple of few trusted friends and i think that's um and to take the time to go through that process um in, in the Brown Church book, I, I, I created this, this thing where I said, um, like 12 tenets of, a, of Brown Christian identity, 12 tenets of Brown Christian identity. And I think those tenets like are pretty good. Like, you know, it's like, like if you follow those tenets, it's not like, like a formula, but like it'll help in that process. But if it's a process and you kind of move forward and you go back and you move forward and back. And um, it's, not, it's not linear for sure. One thing I will say, though, is like, that's where it's really important to find good resources about how we reconstruct our faith in a, in a healthy way. Because unfortunately, I think there's bad stuff out there. I'm just being honest, right? There's stuff that's like, there, there's a lot of stuff about deconstructing, very little about reconstructing. And there's stuff, honestly, that it's not going to, and this is what breaks my heart, it's not going to get folks to keep going down the path in a healthy way. And unfortunately, I've seen that too. I've seen, as a pastor, that's my pastoral heart. Like, oh my gosh. And some folks get, you know, like, um, when, again, it's so important to give as much space and time as you need for that cork to pop off and to, and, and to not rush that. But some folks in that first stage just write everybody off completely and then sort of come up with kind of crazy interpretations of scripture. And I'm just going to be really real, right? And stuff like that. And so it's really important to have you know, healthy models of reconstruction. Hope, hope that helps. And I'd like to learn from you about that. I'm sure you have great answers about that too. <laughs> thank you, Robert. Uh, thank you so much uh, for, for taking some time uh, to share with us uh, about this excellent resource. I think uh, we've all been uh, challenged, we've all been encouraged, uh, we've all felt a, a whole roller coaster of emotions, but uh, really, uh, your your book is a gift, uh, not just to the Brown Church, but to the global church, uh, just across the world. And I look forward to seeing this resource being integrated in Bible institutes, in seminaries, uh, in all spheres and areas of of, of life. Uh, before I ask you to close uh, with uh, with with the beautiful poem. Uh, Brown Church. I think I think it'd be a beautiful way to 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 close off this time. Uh, I wanted at the moment really just to give a quick plug to uh, the the Brown Church uh, book itself. Um, we're going to go ahead and put a link uh, to it here in the in the comment section. If if you haven't had a chance to to purchase uh, that book yet, we'll we'll go ahead and leave it there so that you can access it. Uh, we also had a book raffle uh, that, uh, that some people signed up uh, for, uh, for, for this. So we wanted to announce the winners of that tonight. Uh, so the winners are uh, Amy Allison, uh, Jean Martinez, uh, Michelle Ramsundar, um, Paula Suarez, and 
Chobi Beans, which I think was an Instagram account. Uh, if if Chobi Beans, you are here, uh, you you won. Uh, if you are one of those five people, I ask that you please send your mailing address to migrationchristianconference.com uh, at gmail.com, uh, and we will go ahead and send that resource uh, to you. And for those of you guys who didn't have the chance to win, you're actually going to be sent as well a 30% discount code uh, for this book for attending this webinar. Everybody here on the call will have the opportunity to buy this book at 30% off. So we're going to go ahead and put that uh, in the comment section for you. Uh, so enjoy. Um, and then uh, this, because this is recorded, this will be uploaded uh, onto our Facebook page uh, and, and, and YouTube page. Uh, so I and it'll be promoted on our Instagram page as well. So we're going to go ahead and put a link uh, in that section as well and in the chat section so that you can go onto our Facebook page, go ahead and give us a like, go ahead and follow us on social media. And we'd be uh, more than happy to let you know once that has been uh, updated. Um, and I believe uh, that is all of the announcements uh, for now. Uh, Robert, thank you so much. Uh, would you do us the honors uh, of, of closing us uh, in, in, in a sense of prayer, of, of reflection on, on this poem? Sure, and thank you. I'm, I'm, it's been such an honor. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, so this is the Brown Church poem. I am the Brown Church. God calls me Mija, Mijo. Brown, black, white, even yellow are all within me. When black and white come to talk, my voice is not heard. I am not invited to the table. I share much with my black sisters and brothers, yet my voice is distinct. I long, I cry out to be heard for who I am, the brown church. Yo soy Montesinos gritando in 1511. The conquest is opposed to Christ. Y Bartolomé de las Casas, whose eyes like Moses were open to the suffering of his people and never looked back. Yo soy Sor Juana Inés de la Cruz. My heart burns for the treasures of wisdom which are hidden in Christ. Though machismo assails me, aunque está bloqueado el camino, I do not relent. Yo soy Catarina de San Juan, Latina Poblana. Stolen from Asia, enslaved by Spanish masters, I find freedom as the bride of Christ. I too hold the keys to the kingdom. Yo Padre Antonio Martinez de Nuevo Mexico. Aunque robaron a Aslan, I know no nation holds a manifest destiny to decimate the people of another, also beloved of God. In the time of Jim Crow, they called me wetback, beaner, spick, and sent me to Mexican schools. Yet I am Mendez, Bernal, Perales, Calleros. My children are not cows. You cannot place them in a barn. My children are not animals, you cannot keep them in a cage. Yo soy mamalea y santos elizondo, mujeres forged in tongues of fire. Nadie me detendrá, porque el Espíritu del Señor está sobre mí. I am Dolores Huerta and Cesar Chavez. I was raised in the bosom of abuelita theology and know that the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of God. Unos años después, mis primos huyeron la tierra madre, the land of the Savior, Guatemala, Nicaragua, Honduras, Centro America, Argentina, Peru, Bolivia, Brasil, y el resto de, de Sudamérica. Empujada por el huracán de violencia, Guerillas, Vegan, Priest, Reagan, Priest, all vied for me, yet on Christ my eyes were fixed. I am Gutierrez, Boff, y Romero. Yo sé que el reino de Dios trae liberación, que el Espíritu nos libera. Como protestantes, we also protested porque la ropa anglo-sajón strangled la buena nueva. Soy Padilla y Escobar, recobrando la misión integral del Señor. Yo soy los dos alas del mismo pájaro, puertorriqueño, New Yorican, cubano y dominicano también. Though the colonizers have changed, the cries of Las Casas still ring strong in my ears. I am a dreamer, indocumentado, sin papeles. No human being is illegal. Jesus is mi refugio. I am a child of God. I now seek my voice, thoughts of God, my own. I also am among the 12. God calls me mija, mijo. I am the brown church. We are the brown church.
Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Robert. Uh, thank you for the blessing of the Brown Church. Do you have any final words to leave with us? Oh, just God's peace. God's peace. I know we're all exhausted and it's a terrible, terrible time. But in our weakness, may I pray. Sorry, you're bringing the pastor out of me. Sorry, I'm about to. <laughs> but I'll just say. Bring it, out, yeah. bring it out. In our weakness. In our weakness and our exhaustion, may the Lord Jesus Christ be strong in our weakness. Meet us in our deepest place of, of brokenness now, in the, in the deepest parts of the confusions of our hearts. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you, uh, Robert, and thank you, everybody, for attending uh, this webinar. Uh, we look forward to, to keeping you updated with, with future events. So uh, thank you, everyone, and have a great night. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, everyone. It was an honor. honor. Mm -hmm.